Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, H&E Life. Sorry everyone, I haven't been posting recently and I do have a very good reason for that. I have been job hunting and that kind of took over most of my life. So <laughs> between that and fellowship, I really didn't have time to make new videos for you guys, but I do have good news. My job hunt has finished. I have signed a contract to stay on at Stanford as a clinical assistant professor of pathology, and I will be signing out GI pathology. But unfortunately, I still need to finish my fellowship first. So in the meantime, I'll be making more videos, probably now focusing about my fellowship experience. So in addition to Congratulations, I got a job. I also want to thank everyone who watches my channel because uh, during my short hiatus, I hit a thousand subscribers and I am amazed at the sheer number of people out there who <laughs> want to listen to me ramble about random stuff about my life. But thank you everyone for your support and I really appreciate it. And I hope this channel has been helpful. <laughs> and today, I would like to talk about the job market and the different type of pathology jobs there are out there. I will start by busting a myth about pathology, which is that there is not many jobs out there and uh, AI will take over the future. But I will address the AI part in another video, but I want to talk about all of the job opportunities that there currently are right now in pathology. So let's take a look. It's uh, from Pathology Outlines, and to find this is very easy, is just do Pathology Outlines jobs in Google, and it will take you to this page. And this page will show you all of the jobs. And if you look at this graph, isn't this amazing? There is so many jobs right now. And uh, so right now is a great time to be a pathologist looking for a job. <laughs> but this website is wonderful because it lists a bunch of jobs. And in addition, it also subdivides them into different states or different subspecialties, so it makes searching easier. All right, so I just gave an unendorsed plug for pathology outlines, but I do think this is a great resource for people who are interested to see what kind of pathology jobs there are out there. So one more thing I would like to mention, in addition to pathology outlines, there are actually more jobs than what's listed. So a lot about pathology, and I feel like this is true as a lot of medicine in general, that job availability is kind of a lot of it's word by mouth. So for example, in my brief search for a job, the Stanford pathology job was posted in Path Outlines, but I really mostly heard about it through my program director. And the other three jobs I sent out inquiries for were um, private practice jobs and one industry jobs, and none of them <laughs> was posted on Path Outlines. Surprise, surprise! I learned all of them through word of mouth from other attendings and talking to someone about another job who told me about another job that was available, so that was quite interesting. A good portion of jobs available for pathology is mostly word by mouth, and I don't know exactly what proportion is actually posted on Pathology Outlines versus like word by mouth, but what you see on this list is not exclusive and not exhaustive because there are more jobs out there than you think. So to talk about pathology jobs, it's really divided into three very broad categories and two of them, which is majority of the jobs. Uh, so the number one with the most job availability is in small community practice slash private practice setting. The second one would be an academic center setting, uh, which is the job I have accepted. And the third one is in industry. Surprise, surprise, biomedical industry is looking for pathologists. Okay, let's start with the one that I am most familiar with, which will be in the academic setting. In the academic pathology setting, it's usually in association with large academic hospitals, the ones where they have residency programs. And this includes jobs for both uh, anatomical and clinical pathology. And because it's a large hospital setting with high volume, most of these academic jobs, you can actually break into subspecialty services. And just like for most pathology residencies, the sign out subspecialty service, the attendings sign out as subspecialty services. So in the academic setting, you are able to be AP only or CP only because we subspecialize. But that said, a lot of academic jobs also look for APCP because sometimes whatever subspecialty you sign out may not be a big enough in which it's a full day's worth of work. So they like you to dual subspecialize, kind of, you know, like if you're signing out something that's not as 
a high volume, for example, uh, bone soft tissue. Some places have very little load. So they prefer if you could attach that with something else. So you could say I could do bone soft tissue and I could do GU if that was how you subspecialize and then you'll be sending out both services. Whereas lucky for me, GI and GI almost everywhere is such a high volume that I could do just GI and I am so happy about that. Okay, so in the academic setting, there's the tenure line and the non-tenure line. Tenure is basically a classically thought of academic setting where you work long enough, you basically could stay at the job and you can never get fired. Those jobs are usually much more on the academic side where you have to publish a lot of research, a lot of papers before you could reach tenure and it's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, whereas the non-tenure line is actually the line that I am in, which is more like a medical education educator line where my main purpose is clinical duties and my secondary purpose will be teaching med students and residents and of course in the academic center you can't get away with doing absolutely no academics whatsoever so I will also be having a small portion of my clinical duty as doing some research and publishing. So there are some benefits and downsides to academic jobs. The benefit is you get to subspecialize and you also get to kind of, I guess, have the prestige of being called a professor and being a professor of uh, an academic institution. The downside of it is you have probably the lower setting pay in terms of pathologists in general. Uh, academics institutions pay lower than the average uh, pathologist would make. And when you have less pay, but you also have less production pressure, in an academic setting, you could take your time and work up cases fully, whereas in a non-academic setting, there's more of a production pressure where you need to get cases out, 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 out. So people who are inclined for the academic setting are likely to want to be able to work on complicated cases, do the IHC, do the molecular, and then, you know, come up with some unique diagnoses and also have the opportunity to use these unique diagnoses to be in case studies or research studies and things like that. Another benefit to doing academic, especially as your first job, is that after a few years of academic, you can still move to a community slash private practice setting, whereas the reverse will be more difficult. Uh, academic positions really kind of really want to only keep attracting academic positions, whereas if you went private first, then the chances of coming back into academic setting is much harder, especially because you would have been just doing, you know, case sign outs and you probably wouldn't have any research under your belt. Therefore, it would be very hard for you to come back into an academic setting. And I guess one more negative, if you want to look at it this way, the interview process is much longer. It's usually several rounds of interviews followed by a research talk slash teaching seminar and an unknown slide session for the residents because they also want to make sure not only are you a good candidate, you also have done some research and or and is able to teach at a higher level and also be able to interact with the residents on a good level because a good portion of your job will be training residents in the future. So the interview process is longer and more intense, um, but at the same time, you kind of get to know the place better because you got to talk to a bunch of people, you get to interact with the residents, and you do get a better feel for an academic institution after such a long interview process. So that is a general gist for academics for you guys. Uh, let's move on to private slash community practice setting. A community hospital setting is generally for a non-academic hospital which doesn't have a university attached to it or a medical school attached to it. They are generally on the larger side of a community hospital in your local area or um, it's part of a private group that services multiple smaller uh, community hospitals or is pure private practice and you just go in and to your private practice job office and you just sign out whatever comes to you whereas some private practice in the general community setting you would uh, hop around different hospitals on different days so for example your your practice is a uh, part of a three hospital group so you'll practice one location one day then go to another location for a few days and go to another location for a few days and you just make the rounds and that's how your practice is gone most of the jobs in pathology is in this setting. This setting also gives you much higher pay, like significantly higher pay than in the academic setting. So I could tell you now, uh, I did interview at, you know, private practice and um, 
at you know academic setting and the pay that's offered to me and between and the difference between my academic setting and the private practice was a hundred and thousand dollars difference so that's a lot of money but let me tell you more about private practice and why I chose not to go that way. So in the private practice setting, they really prefer their pathologists to be APCP trained. That said, if you are AP only trained, there's still position for you because a lot of jobs are for surgical pathology or cytology or some combo of that sort, and there's no clinical lab in which they do run. So if you are AP trained, you will still be pretty good in the private practice setting, but the reason they want you to be APCP trained a lot of times they want their one or two designated CP person who will be able to run whatever small lab they also run like for example as a group you're in charge of several small hospitals they will want you to one pathologist to be the clinical director of the small hospital in terms of like you know chemistry and micro and all that stuff but that said, being AP only it will still work. In terms of CP only, there are designated CP only jobs in the private practice setting, but I'm not too familiar with that. But I feel like a lot of CP stuff is somehow associated to a hospital, so it probably be more like a small community practice setting. Uh, back to overall private practice. And that is, uh, once again, much higher pay. But for the higher pay, you probably have more work requirements in the sense that you can't just dilly that all and just ponder away at like hmm you kind of have to here is your caseload for the day you need to get all this done by tonight even though they say you work monday through friday but if you don't get the work done you come in on saturday the same thing is true for an academic setting you know they're like here's your caseload they want you to get everything done but no one's going to be hounding you if you know, if you were late on a few cases, whereas in the private practice setting, they're more likely to be pressured, not within just the group itself, but it's also pressured by the clinicians that uh, send their cases to these private practice settings because these clinicians, if they're unhappy, they could take their business elsewhere and that private practice will now be out of a clinician and all their samples. Another reason why the production pressure is higher for these private practice settings is that a lot of the money comes basically on RVUs. It's basically how many samples they look at and how many cases they sign out. So even if the case is something complicated, requires a lot of work, most of the times in private practice setting, they will just be like, okay, just send it to a higher level institution. So instead of spending time and money thinking and working it up, they'll just say uh, positive for carcinoma pending expert consultation, and they'll send it off somewhere and they'll go back to their next case. Whereas when you're in academics, you make the proper diagnosis when you can, and when you can't, you just keep working at it, doing research, doing more stains, and the, the goal is you are supposed to be an expert in your field and you are supposed to be able to figure it out. That said, it is not unheard of for one academic institution to send their specimen to another academic institution, which they might have experts who are more specialized in that field and might have a better um, chance of making diagnosis. Okay, um, and then in terms of private practice, when they're looking for a pathologist, they kind of just, whenever they need a pathologist, they'll hire a pathologist, whereas an academic institution generally kind of hires on a academic cycle, you know, they'll start looking for a pathologist if they need one, um, say in the fall of one year to fill a position the spring or summer of the next year. Whereas in a private practice setting, if a pathologist leaves, they're looking for a pathologist and they're hoping to fill ASAP. Whereas in the academic institution, you, you know, if you, you have to do a longer interview cycle and then they'll sometimes do multiple interview cycles because the people who are applying weren't exactly what they want or that person like decided not to accept their offer letter. So, and also once, you know, the offer letter is given by the department, it has to go through like the university and the university, you know, will be like, okay, blah, blah, blah. And months later before, it even happens whereas in a private practice setting they give you an offer letter and that's it and whenever you agree to start working that's when you agree to start working so it's a little faster in terms of the private practice setting and oftentimes in private practice setting uh, i mentioned before that they really like their apcp trained people they want to see that either you have had general search path or maybe multiple subspecialty fellowships most private practice places is not subspecialized sign out private practice setting is mostly a generalized sign out in which you sign out any specimen within search path and also sometimes you'll also have to sign out some cytology you'll have to sign out some derm sign out some like bone marrows for even though you're not heme path trained 
brain. That's why private practice settings sometimes can be really hard to practice them because they kind of require that you be good at everything or at the same time you could look at that as you're just like okay at everything. You're like the jack of all trades but expert in none. To me, I kind of didn't like the idea. The reason I did a fellowship is because I went through pathology and I realized I really only really liked GI pathology and looking at other specimens was kind of like, eh, I really don't want to. That's why I'm doing this fellowship. And then now to go look for a job in the prior practice setting, they're like, oh yeah, you'll, you know, since you're GI trained, we'll give you most of our GI specimens, but then you still have to sign out some cyto, which I'm like, okay, I guess I could do that. And then they're like, you have to sign out guy. I was like, oh, I'm not really really into guidance like you have to sign up some breasts it's like i hate breasts <laughs> so uh that's probably why i end up going academic instead of a private practice even though the pay is so much more and that takes me lastly to industry jobs which honestly i didn't know was a thing until i started looking for jobs so how i heard about this industry job since it was not path outlines um was i heard it from one of my old attendings who was like hey i have a friend who's working in industry and they are looking for a pathologist in one of these uh biotech companies that does like cancer screening and molecular protocols so um you know how molecular is the new big thing and everyone's cancers are, is getting a molecular workup and then they could target the specific mutations that's there well so this is a job where you as a pathologist will be looking at slides that's sent to you and you mark the slides saying oh this is cancer please harvest from this area for your r testing and that's basically the job and you do that every day from like nine to five for five days a week and 365 right um and the pay is really good honestly the pay is like equivalent to academic setting but like if all you had to do was like you know circle a cancer have some meetings with people and help develop the new essay or tweak an essay or something like that it's not very like high stress or high volume and as a pathologist that's something i personally thought would be uh, it was very interesting. It's definitely an option where it probably will have the best work-life balance, but I thought that it seems kind of like a waste of all my education, <laughs> uh, to be honest. And it also felt like it's something that like, that sounds like a sweet gig. It sounds like a sweet deal and it will be something I would like to retire on, but it's not something that I think I would upfront be like, yep, Yep, that sounds great. I mean, it does sound great. I was like, oh, that sounds so <sighs> chill, but it's not something that I kind of want to do right away, um, especially since I have worked so hard to get to where I am. Uh, well, that said, that's really the three main components of uh, pathology jobs. And once again, if you are liking the videos I make, please like and subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell and i thank everyone for your support okay bye